I think it takes quite a bit of almost daring to research the very faith that you kind of participate in because I feel like there's almost this notion that could uncover things that you might not want to uncover. A lot of people in society are going to need to understand these people better, whether they like them or not, because this is one of the fastest growing religious groups in North America. I, as well as others, need to unconvince ourselves about the matter of whether religion still matters in our popular culture today. It, it does. In spite of what religion you're a part of or what denomination you're involved in, you're still a human being, right? With feelings and fears and joys and frustrations and being able to contextualize it each time I revisit this and in, in conversations like this is very healing. As I understand that the lunch is just a preamble for the treats. <laughs> a good pie will far excel a good cake, but a bad pie can hit pits that no cake can know. <laughs> <laughs> this is long walk, short drink. You, yeah. You're fitting right in. This, this is, is actually a level. This is actually an area I would like to claim expertise on. <laughs> yeah. <okay>. yeah. <laughs> Greetings, Long Walkers. Dave here to quickly introduce this very special bonus episode in which Twinkie and I will be talking to Dr. Corey Anderson. Dr. Anderson is a rural sociologist researching structural, cultural, and demographic changes among the Amish, Mennonite, and other plain Anabaptists, including the Apostolic Church, which is what our discussion will focus on. He is currently a postdoctoral scholar at the Population Research Institute at Penn State University. He has taught at Truman State University, Missouri, The Ohio State University, the University of Akron, and Ashland University in Ohio, everything from intro to sociology, geography and demography courses, to classes about the sociology of religion, Amish history and popular culture, technology and human values, and even dress and self-image. With over 30 journal articles to his name, Dr. Anderson's work has been referenced worldwide, from the Daily Record in Worcester, the Associated Press, the New York Times, and CCTV in China. Dr. Anderson is the editor-in-chief and co-founder of the Journal of Amish and Plain Anabaptist Studies, a multidisciplinary, peer-reviewed publication that focuses on the plain branches of the seven major Anabaptist religious traditions, Amish, Apostolic Christian Nazarene, Brethren German Baptist, Hutterite, Swiss Mennonite, and Russian Mennonite. He is also the founder and executive director of the Amish and Plain Anabaptist Studies Association, a registered 501c with a board of directors and two subcommittees. You can learn more about that at amishstudies.org. Our conversation with Dr. Anderson will focus on his 2018 article, A Socio-Religious Introduction to the Apostolic Churches in North America. Regular listeners may recall the Journal of Amish and Plain Anabaptist Studies was among Twinkie's list of favorite things from 2020 as discussed in episode 86. And I think maybe it was Palmer who tossed out that it would be great to talk to someone who had studied the apostolic church at an academic level. Um, Twinkie, is that... First of all, yeah, welcome, yeah, Twinkie. <laughs> yeah, no, I think uh, I think it was. And I, uh, you know, particularly grateful to him ever since we brought it up day one. Very supportive. Um, and obviously, without you and his passion for long walk, short drink, we would not be in the uh, position we are right now to interview uh, such a wonderful guest. Well, and of course, um, part of the reason that we are so interested in this uh, topic is because of you having grown up in this church yourself and it has come up on the podcast. I think kind of, we never really delved into it. It was always just like kind of in the background as a, as a major force in our youth. Um, uh, you know, various other friends of ours, uh, Kevin Kit Steiner, who was, uh, has been on the show a number of times, also grew up in that same church and, um, some friends were not so much in touch or at all in touch with nowadays, um, sure. but we're close with back in the day. And so, yeah, we've got a particular interest in this topic because of it, you know, it's hitting uh, very close to home. And um, is it, yeah, I don't know if there's anything you want to contextualize well, about no. that before we... 
Yeah. So, I mean, obviously it's something that's very personal to me, but, but I think one of the issues that can come about with something like this is you're, you're too close to it sometimes. Um, and the emotion can probably um, just overtake maybe just having, I don't know, in, in looking at yourself, the emotions can overplay just learning more about it from someone who is an expert, right? We go to experts when we have sore throats or when we break our legs, we go to experts if we have questions about our finances or our relationships. And so um, this is an opportunity for me, which I am, and I hope I showed my excitement back in episode 86, but you know, I am very excited to talk to an expert about someone who could tell me about the, 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 the church I grew up in from a little bit of a removed perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and with that, let's, uh, we have on the line, Dr. Corey Anderson. Welcome. Good, sir. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Thank you. I'm delighted to be on the show with you all. Oh, we're delighted very to, much. to have you. Yeah. Did I get, did, did I get anything wrong in my intro? I didn't run that by you. I just gave it the old college try. Oh, you nailed everything. That was, that was an encyclopedia of information you yeah. walked through. I hope it felt, in, I mean, like reading it out, I was like, this guy is impressive. So I hope that same thought crossed your mind because <laughs> you have quite the resume. I wish I could convince some of the tenure track search committees of that too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit familiar with that, but I can't get into it. Um, <laughs> but my heart goes out to you. <laughs> uh, um well, so yeah, so you know, we've got a handful of uh, just some general. Oh, I mean, your your articles is great. I, I read it. Um, forgetting, well, I got it in front of me here. How many pages is it? It's been a minute since I read. It's been a minute since I was in college, and so it's been a, a while since I read a. I used to be an English major once upon a time, and so I used to have to write academic papers and read them and relate them to like Foucault and whatnot. But yeah, it's sixty pages, you know. Um, so. And that's an intro, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> uh, this is an, a, an overview. And so um, so a lot of the kind of questions that I have really came out of, of reading that. And then we ran them you know, through with the guys and um, make sure we touched on things that we were all kind of curious about. But maybe we'll just start with a... I, I actually, I would li- like to start with you and how you became interested in studying the Amish and Plain and Baptist. That's a good question. I had not even known much about the Amish or Mennonites when I was growing up. I grew up in Virginia in an area where there was no Amish or Mennonites. Um, It was a rapidly developing rural area on the fringe of the DC suburbs. And uh, I don't have much of a home to go to anymore. It was rural when I grew up there and now it's covered in suburbs. Long ways away from Amish and Mennonite populations. But I became interested in them Uh, Even though I'd grown up in a nominally Christian home, I found my way into a a Baptist church sort of on my own initiative in high school, and then became more interested in all I knew back then of Amish or Mennonite. I came to um, a, um, you could say, a beachy Amish Mennonite church, which is a more progressive wing of the old Amish whom we uh, connect with the horse and buggy. I guess that was my act of teenage rebellion, running off and joining the uh, Mennonites. And um, it was really through that uh, cultural change that I began to take an interest in the social dimensions of what I'm going to say is collectively the plain Anabaptist people, which would include the Amish, the Mennonites, the German Baptists, as well as the apostolic Christian Nazarene people. Um, And even though it was originally a religious quest, it ended up being a cross-cultural experience for me. I went through some um, personal adjustments, learning about these people who who are very American in one sense. And on the other sense, they were not American um, enough that you could just kind of move right in amongst them and transfer all of your, your repertoires of behaviors into their setting which is what I tried to do as a fairly outgoing, even theatrical personality. Um, I probably, I, I gave them a lot to talk about in what might have other bit, otherwise been a fairly boring world for them. Um, th- then I came along. Religious converts into the Amish and the Mennonites do give them quite a bit to talk about, and I probably gave them more to talk about than a lot of them. So um, it was maybe through a lot of the personal crises that I faced 
when it came to misunderstanding, when it came to feeling ganged up against or not understanding sanctions, or even some personal disappointments with um, how their religiosity was lived out, um, that I, I began to grapple more and more with the social dimensions of the people. Prior to that, as a Baptist, I was sort of trained as a, um, a biblicist to rationalize the entirety of society based on a biblical worldview. And while I still consider myself a, a biblicist, at the same time, I very much value um, a social empirical lens for additional insight and understanding people and understanding culture. The nitty gritties of um, um, any society and any place or time across the globe. And it's been a very valuable lens. Um, so originally I was planning on becoming a land use and transportation planner. I did my master's degree in planning, hit a crisis in my church in uh, Virginia. And at that point decided to pursue a PhD in sociology with this particular emphasis on figuring out the people that I joined. I didn't realize then when I started on that quest that in a few years I would be looking for a some sort of sociology professorship and that that wasn't a question most sociologists were really interested in. Um, sociology of religion has a little bit of an underground rap in the larger field of sociology, um, as does rural sociology. And so the combination, um, I think, has made it difficult for me to land a, um, a permanent tenure track professor job. But my recent work at Penn State, the uh, Penn State has been the most supportive university I've been at through, through all this time, um, even as I did receive a lot of support as well from Truman State University. But um, the, 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 I think um, being at Penn State, it's really given me um, maybe a leg up on what the broader relevance is of the research that I'm doing beyond just sort of like a personal attempt to understand the people that I had joined better. Um, because a lot of people in society are going to need to understand these pe people better, whether they like them or not, because this is one of the fastest growing religious groups in North America, the Plain Anabaptists collectively. Um, the Amish are doubling at a rate of every two decades, and that is extremely rapid growth. Um, and, and that's largely due to high fertility, but also high retention rates. Even a community like where I live right now in Holmes County, Ohio, which is a very large Amish community where the fertility rate is fairly low, we're looking at around an average of five children per woman among the Amish. That's very, very low. Um, on the upper end, we see communities that the average number of children per woman completed fertility is um, about 11 and a half. So um, these groups are growing, they're spreading out primarily in rural America. They are having an oversized impact on rural America. So it's gonna be increasingly important to understanding, uh, understand who these plain Anabaptist people are. And so I find myself positioned now having explored at least a little bit in every single plain Anabaptist tradition and some of them a lot more than others to, um, maybe not be a public spokesperson for them, but at least point, you know, people who are working with them towards certain ideas that they would want to pursue further. You keep calling me like the expert, the expert, the expert on these things. And honestly, I'm just trying to learn. <laughs> um, and if there's some things that are helpful to people, um, then I'm glad. Um, just providing a little bit of insight into a lot of groups where I've learned some things I, I, I hope can help. Spoken like a true expert. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, um, th yeah, th for me, these terms, especially, yeah, pl actually both plain and plain Anabaptist, I don't know if they're separate, were new to me. Um, and so Twinkie had a kind of a, a fun spin on a way to unpack that a little bit for others to whom those might be foreign terms. Yeah, I was curious, uh, Dr. Anderson, if you would uh, give us a shot at kind of uh, a brief overview of Anabaptism. And, you know, how, what, when I grew up in Ritman, Ohio, people used to think it meant anti-Baptism yeah. or anti-Baptist, like I hated Baptists. And so um, just, for the, just for the listener who, who may not be completely familiar, how, how would you uh, 
describe maybe Anabaptism and a brief history of Anabaptism, um, uh, you know, from, I don't know, Menno Simons or wherever you want to start to where you are today in Holmes County, Ohio? Yes, a brief history and a <laughs> brief history of Anabaptism because there's way too many details to get bogged down in. This were the people on the coattails of Martin Luther in the 1520s who said, yes, we want church revisions, but we do not want a state church. We want a particular uh, group of people who are self-committed to the church and committed to holiness. That is the essence of Anabaptism. It's a free church, apart from the state, where members are held to some sort of holiness standard. Beyond that, it evolved into several other directions. Now, one of the most common shared sentiments among Anabaptists as well is a position on peace or non-resistance. Will not go to war, but also a reservation against lawsuits um, or any sort of retaliatory action. So Anabaptists often have some sort of suspicion towards like governance, state governance. They've had a long history of persecution in Europe. At first, it was um, uh, physically being put to death. Later on, it was just fines and exiles. When they moved to America, especially in mass in the 1700s, and then also into the 1800s, until about 1850 is when the migration really led up. Um, they, they were pretty much, uh, didn't have homes in Europe. Some, some principalities were, hosted them um, more warmly than others. When they got to America, they're like, we can finally do our own thing. No one's breathing down our back anymore. So that's, that's, uh, that's Anabaptist in a nutshell. They were the first free church. This idea that you make a personal decision and commitment to the church and that you personally believe this and that's why you remember the church really began in our modern times with the Anabaptist movement. It inspired the Baptists. To a, another degree, it inspired the Methodists, and, and pretty much you could see that root of inspiration in even churches in America today who are known sort of as their as a high church format with infant baptism still have sort of incorporated some of these Anabaptist critiques and revisions into allowing um, their their young people and their teens to like personally confirm this is their church when they come to an age of decision. So it's no surprise that a lot of Anabaptists, um, even though there are a lot of mainstream Anabaptist bodies, they are one of um, Christianity's most consistent producers of sectarian movements, persistent intergenerational sectarian movements, because they have a distrust of, um, of the government that will show up in various ways. But, but um, they also have a sense of just like, we are a chosen people. We are a, we are a holy people. We're biblicists. We are following the Bible as closely as possible. We're putting it into practice in very tangible ways. We have church structures that keep us accountable. Church membership is absolutely required to be part of, um, to really be included in the sense of uh, being an Anabaptist. Church is very important to them. So that emphasizes sort of like the, the collective community aspect of Anabaptism. This is also a social group. Um, it's not just a religious theology. It's also very much embedded in a social system. And then naturally, of course, it's also going to take on very thick ethnic and cultural components. Questions? <laughs> well, uh, the one, may, maybe you said this and I kind of missed it, but how, where does the word plain, what does that distinction connotate? That's an interesting term. It's it's been used variously, but today it at its most simplest definition would be a an Anabaptist denomination where some sort of dress expectation exists, namely a head covering for women and skirts for women. Um so plain is maybe an interchangeable term for what some other denominations, such as the Wesleyans or Methodists, would, would say the term holiness. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's some sort of practical, tangible way to make Christianity realized and that primarily shows up in the clothes. 
at its most strictest form, it's also going to show up in like vehicles, namely a horse and buggy. It's going to show up in home decor. It's going to show up in occupation, um, plain, simple, unadorned. So it could be used in a variety of ways. That's helpful though. Yeah, thank you. Just to kind of key on that a little bit, I remember being, you know, you mentioned, of course, um, women kind of being the emphasis to some degree on some of that. But I remember even some very uh, strict instruction that my haircut, of course, would not be anything that was fashionable at the time necessarily, but would be a fairly straightforward haircut. So, you know, as Dr. Anderson said, there's this kind of rejection of the popular at the time, at least in the apostolic church yes. when I grew up a rejection of the popular and um, this notion that you're going to have, there's an expectation of, of, uh, you know, being like other people and a uh, community and we're as the rest of the group. Yes. Well, I'm looking at, um, at page 48, the characteristic, there's the figures um, five and six, uh, you know, characteristics of everyday dress and apostolics and, and the women, woman's head co covering. And man, there are, two people in particular in these photos that look like they could have been like specific people we grew up with. Okay. So the woman below when, um, I didn't know who that was when I took that photograph, but, um, when I visited her congregation, she walked up to me and said, Hey, do you recognize me? And she turned one 180 degrees <laughs> pointed at her head. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's great. That's wild. Well, that actually leads into to my next question because I wanted to ask about your experience conducting the research for that for the article that that we read. Um, how did you approach the congregations and like contextual contextualizing your research visits and interviews to them to kind of get the permission? This was an informal process. It wasn't, um, I was not engaged in formal research when I was beginning to just learn about and discover the apostolics. So a lot of what I'm putting in here is just uh, the accumulation of anecdotal evidence that doesn't rely on you know, intense first person interviews that would, that is somehow intended to like generalize information or probe opinions. Um, it's just sort of, um, you could almost say like it's research that's more of a, an editorial or an encyclopedic approach to just, here's what I've been learning about these people. I, th I think it's deeply fascinating that, that you are doing this kind of from within. Um, and, the, and I would, I would imagine that that would kind of, can't, can't come up with a better phrase, but other than like, I would say extend some goodwill perhaps. And I, I guess I was wondering if you, what was the general attitude in those group interviews or when people did know that you were a writer, were people, were the subject reserved or like especially open? Did they seem to like want to be better understood or kind of clear up misconceptions and that might appear in whatever you wrote? Well, you know? um, people have been exceptionally open. Um, so consider that my garb consists of a homemade button-up shirt, broad fall pants and suspenders with um, uh, an Amish beard and a, an Amish style beard with, with no mustache, even though my beard isn't that long. Um, and, and empathy with the concept of plain Anabaptism is embedded in my appearance. And so that puts me in a very unique role when I'm approaching all these other plain Anabaptist groups unlike, uh, we'll just say like a secular or non-Anabaptist researcher, researcher attempting to research the plain Anabaptist. Because immediately upon first glance, they know that I'm living it, even if they don't know, you know what, ex what exact denomination it might be, as in the case of many apostolic Christians, they're not really well acquainted with the vast diversity of Anabaptist groups. Not that many other Anabaptists are either, since there's well over a hundred plain Anabaptist denominations, but the apostolic are, are, are particularly to themselves compared to some of the other groups. Um, but, you know, I walk into their church services, and even if I'm, I'm not going about any research business, I'm just kind of there to um, um, join them in, in worship for that day, they can still take one look at me and realize that I represent something 
um, religious and familiar, even if it's not them. Hmm. So in that case, they don't have to wonder a lot what I think as a researcher. And if anything, the conversation is going to more immediately move to topics where we can assume a lot of background knowledge with each other, that we can have certain like third or fourth level deep conversations immediately without needing to probe, first of all, a lot of primary questions um, in order to gauge how much empathy you could have with each other. Hmm. And in fact, that is something that plain Anabaptist people do a lot. They embed um, types of orientations, ideological orientations and empathies within their dress. And so that upon visual acquaintance with someone, you can not only tell like what general type of affiliation that other person might be, but also if they're pointed maybe in a little bit more stricter or progressive direction. There's a lot of information embedded in plain Anabaptist dress. Um, so you have to take that in consideration when I'm visiting around in these churches that at first glance, they, if they do not know me, they think some sort of Amish or Mennonite. The real identi identity clarification comes when I try to also explain that I am a researcher. Maybe they didn't even really recognize that you were a researcher. Um, you know, someone with a PhD just because of your apparel and, you know, how you looked. Yeah. The writer thing, perhaps, where it's like maybe the researcher didn't necessarily mean something, but they're like, oh, he's writing something. <laughs> Is that? Yeah. He's yeah. familiar with us. Yes. He's writing something. <laughs> <laughs> but they're open to that. It, it sounds like in, uh, yeah, you said use, I find that interesting. The word, the use of the word empathy. Um, I guess I was imagining the, I kept the word I would imagine is like that be more trusting, but I, I I don't know. There's something I think there's something interesting to me about your choice of words with empathy, or maybe and maybe not maybe that's not unique uh, for you because it but it, it struck me. Um, My ideas have been heavily influenced by a socio linguist from Germany who studied the Amish in the 1970s and 80s. His name is Werner Enninger. His work is relatively unknown, but I think he was a mastermind of Amish research. Um, in volume five, issue two of Joppas, I sort of did a labor of love article to attempt to synthesize his very scattered and difficult work. Hmm. I take the word empathy from him. He applied it to some of his research on Amish dress. And it's a phrase I like because it not only embeds the concept of trust because we trust those who have been in the same experience, but also that I look upon someone and immediately know that he or she is acquainted with this whole constellation of scripts, conversations that can be had just by appearance. Well, I know kind of, even when I go to apostolic Christian churches, I can kind of see I'm, I'm probably going to have better conversations with um, uh, one of these men who has maybe a bit of a uh, let's see, a dark lapel suit versus the one with the Mickey Mouse tie and a beard. Mm. The one with the Mickey Mouse tie and the beard kind of looks at me and just ugh, isn't interested because he's already visually signaling um, his negation of plain Anabaptism in elements of his dress. Uh, yeah, hmm. that, that actually really makes sense. Um, yeah. Particularly with, you know, we were growing up, you know, there, there's you know, people that grow up in the church don't necessarily join the church as we know it until, you know, they make that decision. And until that time, and especially it seemed like with some of our friends, as they, we, we realize in hindsight, like they were close to making that decision, but that there seemed to be like, oh, their hair was long or their dress was kind of more radical. And then suddenly the shift was that much more dramatic. But I, I could see that in what you're mentioning about like just the Mickey Mouse tie or whatever, the signaling going on there. Yeah, for sure. I, and that's what I like about the article. And I think I expressed this in um, the clip that Dave sent you was just that I'm fascinated because I think it takes quite a bit of, I don't know, just a, a real sense of authenticity to and, and almost daring to research the very faith that you kind of participate in, because I feel like there's almost this notion that could uncover things that you might 
not want to uncover. And so that's, I think that's why it's fascinating. And in fact, I just got my copy of uh, the autumn version and I've been working through the articles. Um, it's kind of slowly. I started with the masculinity among the Amish because you talked about that soft patriarchy, but I, 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 uh, I've just really, it's the best 50 bucks I think I spend all year. So Oh, that's good to hear your <laughs> your association membership and subscription. You mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. yeah. I'd have to say, uh, I I enjoyed in our most recent issue on the subject of gender, our symposium discussion between three three respondents who are who are um, responding to an anthropologist research on Amish women and that anthropologist is retired and at the end of their career and in the symposium discussion we have three respondents one of them is an anthropologist from Germany who is extremely brilliant and I thought she put together an excellent essay but I just enjoyed the two other essays which were written by plain Anabaptist women uh, who may not have jumped through all of the gradations of academia to get a PhD, but have it in effect for their own setting. And their responses were very characteristic of their setting. One was a conservative Mennonite author who was quoted in this, um, this anthropologist book um, as a writer. And the, the other um, is, is also a brilliant Amish um, woman in her 40s who just recently married, just recently married. And she married another, uh, um, a man also, I believe in his 40s, who himself is sort of an, a, a, a given honorary hat tip from academia to for all that they've done and accomplished. So I just love to hear their, the, the voices coming from plain people engaging scholars back because for so long um, scholarship on the plain people has been conducted by non-adherents. And there's a stronger feeling now that our, our emic perspective, our view of the world, um, our voice has been appropriated for other ideological purposes in, attempt, in, in interpreting the Amish to the outside world. So I'm excited to see through this journal opportunities to, to find ways, even as it's primarily an academic journal, it's primarily academic people who are writing in it. It represents um, maybe a shift in how we approach researching the plain Anabaptist people, both the academics, but then also saying that there's plenty of brainiacs among the plain people who, um, who, can, who can on, on confident ground engage the work of these academics who are interpreting something like Amish women to the quote unquote outside world. Yeah. I, 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 I like, yeah, we want to, you want to hear from people who live it. I think there's a, you know, I, there's a, a real benefit to, to boots on the ground, you know, people who can relate their experiences to a broader audience. And that's so valuable. I, I look, I, once maybe some of this COVID stuff dies off, I'd really like to attend the conference that you do in Millersburg. Um, first of all, Millersburg is beautiful, um, but also um, just to be able to kind of experience the setting, you know, mixing, I'm assuming people from the plain community and also people from the academic setting as well. Yes, we would love to have you. I, um, I think some of my... Um, some of the highlight memories that I have in my college teaching so far was when I was but an adjunct in the area of the Rittman church. And I had some apostolic Christian students in my classes because uh. nearly all plain Anabaptist um, denominations don't have their people going on to college levels. So it was sort of an interesting, um, uh, nice and pleasant to kind of have a little bit of overlap in those worlds right there among my student body. And yeah, and there's other voices too. I don't know how much you listen to podcasts or not, but there's a podcast that just started called just plain wrong. And um, it's three Mennonite librarians who read literature, usually written um, 
by non plain people, but, uh, you know, kind of like those, I guess they describe it as Harlequin romance, if it, as you were, but about Amish or plain Anabaptist groups, but also movies and just give their perspective growing up in various, um, levels, I think of the Mennonite uh, churches or various, you know, levels of conservatism and, uh, um, just again, voices that live it or have lived it, maybe, you know, varying degrees now. Um, and having them talk about it is really insightful and uh, very cool. Yes, I, I can't necessarily endorse um, wide sale adoption of higher education among the plain Anabaptists, um, but I, I take pleasure in the occasional one that somehow does manage to enter higher education and achieve something. Right now at um, Penn State University, I haven't met him, but there is, there is another, um, there is a horse and buggy Mennonite young man who is getting his PhD. And it's in um, uh, agricultural, uh, agriculture disease, um, plant pathology, that's what I want to say. Plant <laughs> pathology, and it's just, <laughs> it's amazing to think that his church supports him and trusts him enough to go and do that I don't think they're going to open up wholesale to everyone, but right. ones who step out like that, who are who are confident and embrace what their particular religious tradition holds, and finds way to selectively engage academia and bring important insights back to a, a culture that normally doesn't benefit directly from that. I think as these populations grow, we are going to see more and more of you know, those kind of people, even if it's just still a few here and there. I am a minority in academia. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to say anything, but. <laughs> I don't know whether to check the boxes that say whether I'm a minority or not when I apply. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like it sometimes when um, um, one of my academic mentors at one of the universities I was at through our discussion decided that probably the best approach to take to my identity in the classroom is to merely have it out on the first day of class. Hi, everyone. I, you look at me and you think I'm Amish, don't you? And I always ask them, am I? What do you think? So we play guessing game for a little while while they scrutinize me from literally from hair to toe to figure out whether that's Amish <laughs> or not. And like, what do you Amish have PowerPoint? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I end up giving them a little bit more of a complex answer and say, well, actually, I'm Amish Mennonite, which um, would be in the Amish tradition, um, but a little bit more progressive on some things. So, uh, yeah, that identity within the classroom, it's one thing when I walk into the churches and my identity is as researcher, but then when I walk into the university classroom and my identity, the salient identity is who is this, you know, hick? And I say that because of the rural peasant type of dress that plain people characteristically wear. Um, so, you know, there's a sense in which um, I'm a minority on both sides of the fence. Uh, wherever I go, I'm always having to explain myself. And like, what's someone like you doing in a setting like this? Yeah, I could definitely see it. I, I mean, I, I absolutely, that's why we were curious about interactions, you know, with the apostolic church and in interviews just regarding how their acceptance or lack thereof. So. What, what distinguishes the apostolics from other plain Anabaptists? The apostolics were latecomers to the Anabaptist movement. They started in the um, more or less around the 1830s. Samuel Freilich was a charismatic leader out of the Swiss Reformed Church who wanted to, just like the Anabaptists, have a church where people who are convinced and convicted of what the church stood for constitute the members. Um, he had particular contours of his beliefs that maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less fit Anabaptism, um, but his movement was popular enough and created enough of a social movement that um, uh, it really constituted a new wave of converts into the Anabaptist movement. Um, so 
maybe some of the distinctiveness of the apostolic is there has been a very high, um, a high currency is placed on um, total purity from sin. Maybe even a little bit more than the other Anabaptists. Um, that is, is total and necessary. And that comes from um, a very strong conversion experience. And as perhaps emphasized, um, like the the, in, the internal experience that an apostolic Christian convert goes through to become one with the church is a more intense process than among most other Anabaptist groups, where joining the church is still a matter of choice officially, but it's also a little bit more routinized, ritualized. There's an easier process within which to enter. For an apostolic Christian. Um, there's, there's a, a much more of a deep inward reflection and a key term in this process is repentance. I have begun repenting. And by beginning to repent, you go about and try to, try to probe the wrongs that might have been committed before you started repenting. And you go about and, and you try to make those things right until you assert yourself enough that God has given you peace in your soul. And then if there's sort of agreement about that among those who are observing you, then you proceed into baptism into being taken into the church. So this process of repenting, um, even though other Anabaptist groups are familiar with the idea of repentance and value the idea of repentance, it really is a, a key term among the apostolics that has a, a level of depth and value that um, the other Anabaptists haven't necessarily given it. I would say that's a very important emphasis among the apostolics and that deep repentance process is what gives them such a, uh, maybe a little bit more of a stronger embrace on the concept of like total purity as a church member. Sinlessness can be realized um, on this earth. It's not just an after earth state. I'll be quick to add that a lot of this idea is changing and is contested, but um, this is the historic apostolic emphasis. You could find it in both the uh, Eastern European branches, which we call the Nazarenes, and then the American branches, uh, which we are talking about as the apostolic Christian people. There may be a few other unique practices to the apostolics that the other plain Anabaptists don't have, uh, there's an affection for the brotherhood that that um, that I just don't know that most other plain Anabaptists have that same level of affection. And you could see it in um, one of their practices called the greeting. At the end of each church services, um, the leader asks, are there greetings? And people stand up and they say greetings from, and then they say the name of the congregation. If you are visiting from that congregation or you had visited from that congregation, you can bring greetings. And even though it is a somewhat ritualized process, it's, um, it's, a, it's a practice I haven't seen in any other Anabaptist church. And even the, like the words of those town names kind of hold this sentimental effect among people. Um, you know, greetings from um, Rittman, greetings from Laddie. Greetings from uh, Fairbury. These, these, just these town names that the church is located in has a little bit of uh, emotional value. Another practice that um, we can have, uh, I guess you could say we can, we can um, ooh and awe at a little bit more, and I think the apostolic Christian people are fully aware that people ooh and awe at this, is called faith marriage. No dating, but as the young man or in some cases, the middle-aged or even older man feels a particular leading or prompting towards a sister, then he may put in his inquiry, which goes through proper church channels. And then if she says yes, then they're planning on a wedding in a um, few weeks. That can be really fast for our casual dating society. And even for Amish and Mennonites and um, other plain Anabaptist groups, that's really fast. 
Yeah, I was I was hoping to contextualize that. That's one of the things in the community, like you've just indicated, that was fascinating to people outside of the apostolic church. And so I was curious where that fits in with other plain Anabaptist denominations as far as maybe how they go about uh, dating or, or not dating or whatever the word is there, and then uh, their marriage process. You know, at one end, you have plain Anabaptist groups where casual dating is, is acceptable. Those tend to be among some of the um, old order, more traditional groups, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> There are those that also have tried to implement reforms to that casual dating, and um, there would be more supervision from adults. At its most extreme, every single date would be supervised by parents um, in some groups or or some sort of other adult. There wouldn't really be much of any alone time. But um, apostolic Christians, as with all other plain Anabaptists, emphasize the sanctity of marriage, you enter into it with seriousness, and it is a life commitment. If there does happen to be a divorce, which is very, very, very rare, um, there's practically no plain Anabaptist group that permits remarriage while a former spouse still lives. Yeah, I remember when uh, someone I knew, um, uh, it would have been the first person, it was like my oh gosh, grade school girlfriend. So that means, you know, passing notes and liter- chasing on the playground. Those are the, that's casual <laughs> dating in fifth grade in <laughs> Riven, Ohio in the eighties. Uh, it was serious business though. But anyway, when, uh, when uh, shout out to Joanna, when Joanna got <laughs> married and, and uh, pr- it would have been the, just a year out of high school. I think we were, um, exchanging tape letters and she was detailing a little bit like the kind i guess you would call it the courtship of this person and how he had to go um to to the el to, i hope i'm getting this right to the elders to yeah, kind of correct uh, yeah ask uh ask not so much ask her <laughs> but ask them um yeah and this was uh, this was just a few months really before i started to become close with our friend twiki that that i there was a lot of people dr anderson where we grew up that were a part of this church. Um, and, uh, it was not uncommon to see like the dress that you describe. And, um, but there, there were, it was so, um, mysterious. And so this is really interesting for me, especially to kind of through, through reading your work and having, you know, explaining this stuff to us today to kind of understand a bit more of the, yeah, the sociological kind of realities of the, of the, of the community and the, in the faith, or would you call it a faith or just a tradition? Faith tradition is it okay to call it a faith? Is that I usually right? just use a religious tradition. Okay, yeah. Now again, to, to contextualize the whole the uh, repentance process as well, like Doctor Anderson described, my, you know, mine was probably about a year and a half that it took, which might be on a little bit of the longer side. But you know, uh, I remember oh, I was see I was twenty nineteen or twenty at the time, and even going back to like old. I should say old, but uh, high school teachers, for example, and apologizing for how I acted in class, you know, and things, you know, really kind of probing the depths of kind of all this guilt that you maybe felt as not doing the right thing, um, as it were. And and, uh, obviously, if you had stolen something, you would try to pay it back or, you know, mistreated someone, you would definitely make sure you went and apologized to them and asked their forgiveness about how you had treated them. And, um, you know, it, it, it's for sure a, a, a rigorous, depending on the individual, I'm sure, and the degree to which they felt like they had um, had wrongs out there that they needed to correct. And uh, Twinkie, um, mm-hmm. am I... Right, that this is somewhat of a humiliating process that really does have a transformative effect on one's character. Absolutely. I, I while while I uh, am clear about my no longer being a member, that yeah. process is very, very, very useful for me um, because now it, it it's empowering to some degree. Because after having gone through that, um, it's much easier to approach someone and say, "Hey." I was wrong about that, or my spouse with whom I have disagreements, or my children with whom I maybe get upset at maybe a little too quickly. But it's something I carry with me um, for sure. 
to be able to say, hey, this thing was not maybe to my standard of what I would have liked or how I would have liked to have handled it. And I, I have this ability to reach back to that experience and, and say, no, you can go and talk to that person and, and, and have clarity. You know, it might not be in the context of um, forgiveness from, from God, as it were, but it is the ability to make things right and uh, uh, have good relate, have better relationships, hopefully <laughs> uh, in the end. I really think too, that um, the repentance ritual has uh, has been one contributing factor to this 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 uh, very generalized abstract apostolic personality. Um, I know not everyone in any particular group carries the same personality, but there's just kind of traits and personalities that you come to expect as I visit different plain Anabaptist groups. Um, anything from just like suspicion and rudeness down to you know, what I consider, I consider the apostolic Christian people absolutely one of the warmest, friendliest people that I visit when I go visit plain Anabaptist churches. And I really think part of that's coming out of the, the emphasis on um, repentance. It does something about the way you, you see yourself standing before others. It, 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 it takes out some of the roughness of your edges. It gives you a softness as you interact with people. Yeah, I would agree. Um, it allows me to empathize, maybe some degree, it, to some extent, uh, to my own harm, in the sense that I f- I definitely feel for others. Um, um, uh, the example I give is sometimes it's hard for me to watch certain movies um, because I I feel the character and what they're going through um, to the point where it's a, a little painful at times. But yes, for sure, it allows you to to see like, I, I was once this way as well. And I, now I'm maybe acting in a different way and I can, I can see where other people are. Maybe they're having a little bit of a hard time, been there, you know, and can walk with them a little bit. I want to, um, I was going to ask this later, but, uh, it, it's come up. I mentioned the, the apostolic, um, grade school girlfriend I had and then um, and the tape letters we were exchanging even after she joined the church and then at least I think she would yeah she, to, in order to get married she would have had to have joined the church right yeah that's correct uh, only marriage yeah. within the church for well yes yes for the most part yeah most and part. then Twink you just mentioned about you know the uh, watching movies and it's made me think of it and I, I know you know you're not in the church now but it, it reminded me of the question about, we had about technology and entertainment and the uh, ACCA and so my one of the that's that was one of the most distinguishing factors that, that you know of that kind of mysterious religion that it didn't necessarily understand as a child was that but I did know that they didn't have TVs in their houses um though like you know the what well, we got the kind of that high school sort of just post high school group of friends music was one of the things over which we bonded most with those um those young people who had not yet joined the the church. And once they did, that was one of the main things that, that changed. But um, I also know that a lot of things it sounds like have, have uh, are shifting. And and so I was wondering, Dr. Anderson, what you could kind of tell us about the spectrum of acceptance for technology, at least in your research on this. Oh, that's just a storm cloud of a question. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) In most every plain Anabaptist church right now, Um, church uh, congregations, denominations are dividing, dividing, dividing over technology among the plain Anabaptists. You hear some of the issues that um, Christian denominations are dividing over in this day and age, and it's just like, well, they're, these ones are dividing over issues of what? Like TV and media? <laughs> um, so nearly all plain Anabaptist groups, as, um, as um, quite a few holiness emphasizing Protestant denominations that also make requirements for their members in dress um, barred television when television came out. Some of these had also banned uh, radio when radio was um, the source of you know, people's um, amusement. However, there is a struggle in many plain Anabaptist denominations that have rejected television, but then accepted computers but then didn't think that the VHS technology on TVs turned into DVD technologies on their computers and that now they could get a DVD and watch it. 
and that if they had accepted dial-up internet, um, all of a sudden with high-speed internet, you could get live streaming uh, media. And now you could just sign up for, um, you could sign up for, oh, what is it like? Virtually everything has a streaming service now. <laughs> so yeah, like yeah, Netflix or Prime, <laughs> Amazon yeah. Prime or yeah, for sure. I asked some of my students a few years ago, like, what are your hobbies on the first day of class in introductions? And they kept saying Netflix. And, <laughs> thing. I, and after a while I figured it out. It was that, it was that like machine that was red colored outside of pharmacies and dollar generals where you get DVDs. And I, I had that belief for a bit and no, no, they corrected me on that. Yeah. I just thought it was, now I just listen to these students go, I, going around. I finally just told my new classes when we're doing introductions, Netflix is not a hobby. <laughs> uh, so, um, now, you, now among the apostolic Christian, as among um, the Beachy Amish Mennonites, as among some conservative Mennonites, as among some old order Amish, even, there's a lot more media consumption. There's, um, you know, for example, some of the pushing the line old order Amish have battery powered DVD players and they're watching videos in their homes. And this is a bit open and acceptable among, but, but they will not drive an automobile. Um, so we're getting into a period where this is an interesting time in history among the plain Anabaptists. What are they going to do about audiovisual media? Um, what are they going to do about the DVDs, the streaming media, the internet? Um, and a lot of denominations are dividing over that. Among the apostolic Christians, yes, historically, they have said no to television. Oh, there were some, you could say, naughty ones that did um, in hiding. But um, it wasn't really an out in the open endorsed practice. I guess you could say also maybe some of the most progressive apostolic Christian churches would have would have been a little bit more accepting of television. Um, but it was nothing that was really out in the open. Now, TV, TV, what? But um, DVDs and streaming media is is much more acceptable. And one of the most interesting places I have found that it shows up is that apostolic Christians are not to visit the church services of other denominations. And the practice of sharing your greetings, if you were last Sunday and then this Sunday you're back home and you share your greetings and we find out where you were, is, is kind of one latent way of, you know, making sure people are staying staying. Um, in our dots, in our connect the dot arena, rather than visiting other church services. Why not visit other church services? I guess you could put it in really broad terms and just say like doctrinal purity, non-fraternization with um, other groups. Some people have said that this is sort of lended to a one true church um, doctrine among the apostolic Christians. I have trouble finding that, but I do find a very high evaluation of our particular doctrine and church network. Um, doctrinal purity. So I noticed that among apostolic Christian churches that the preaching style, there is sort of a, like a classic preaching style. I think I mentioned the article um, where it's, it's, uh, it, it's calm, but it's pleading and it's wanting the unrepentant to repent and come to the faith. Uh, it it is, a, is a style that I can see in a number of different ministers that most apostolic Christians probably aren't even aware that that's kind of like our distinctive style. But they do, some of them do notice when there is a preaching style where it's like, this seems different. This just seems different. I'm sitting there and thinking, this is like mega church preacher style preaching community mega churches so what we see um and i i've you know i've only got about 10 years of um uh, of experience with the apostolic christians but it seems like it's it's been a growing a growing shift where there's more and more ministers that are adopting that mega church preacher style 
which is loud and in, it's it's intense, um, but it's got like it, it's theatrical. It's got down moments where you feel intimate, and then suddenly it's like crank up the decibels, and, and, and it's sort of loud and intense. Um, that sort of style is just kind of meant to bring about uh, accept Jesus into your into your heart type of commitments. That's coming into the apostolic Christian churches, and more and more ministers are adopting that particular style. Where are they getting it from if they're not visiting mega churches? They are getting it from media, mm. by and large. They're, even though they are not visiting the services of other denominations, they are listening to mega preachers, watching them on their internet connections, um, and they're absorbing a style. That is, that is in touch with the times today. So I find that one of the more interesting areas where there is an impact on um, apostolic Christian people from more access to audiovisual media, um, it, it's affecting things right up to the pulpit. Yeah, I, I, I'm totally fascinated. Uh, you mentioned, and I, I've, I've thought about this since I've read the article, the um, the introduction of the smartphone into the plain communities, um, just with ubiquitous access to the internet. You know, we discussed even 20 years ago, maybe a little longer, you could say, hey, don't have a TV, don't have a radio. And you've, you've kind of cut off, for the most part, information, right? Newspapers, obviously, and some other forms of media. But now you can get anything you want on your smartphone at any time. And you mentioned research uh, by McClure talking about how just what you described where this access to the internet does lend itself towards this non-denominationalist leaning. And I do find that interesting. And um, my, the church I grew up in the apostolic Christian church of America, I found out um, because I was wanting to listen to uh, unfortunately a, uh, a funeral service. They have an app there. There is indeed an app for the apostolic Christian church of America and I could pull it up on my phone and pick the service from a, a list of saved services and um, listen to that on demand. Whereas before, I would have had to get a cassette tape, um, at least back when I was a member, which would have been in the early 2000s again, or they used to be able to dial in by phone. You know, you'd call a number and I think maybe a passcode or something, and then it would, but it was only live when yeah. that service was happening. And so, you, you bring this up specifically, and it's something that I, I'm curious. Do you see now more of a leaning in these denominations that have begun to accept this as media access a little more like, you know, use your time wisely, be cautious of what you're watching versus don't have smartphone, don't use this? Is there a, a shift in how they're recommending these things to their congregations or has that not changed too much? Oh, absolutely. You are right on. And this is going on in a lot of plain Anabaptist denominations. There is forever a shift from the authority of the, the institution of the church to the authority of the individual in making his or her own daily decisions. So there is now an emphasis instead of on like, we are going to build into the system a way to make it difficult to access stuff that we do not want. Two, well, now we need to teach people so that they understand better um, and can make decisions on their own. It's a very American way of thinking. Right. And it does show the way that um, Anabaptist people have now been in America for the apostolics have been here since 18, around 1850. The Amish and Mennonites have been here since the early 1700s. Plain Anabaptists may have this self-perception of being separate from the world and distinct from the world, but they are a very American people at the same time. And it, it's continuing to show up um, in interesting ways. Uh, so, you know, one of the... Um, the shift in technology is also accompanied by another very interesting shift going on among the apostolic Christians, and that is um, um, big business culture. Hmm. There is an increasing presence of um, maybe business management psychology being applied to managing the church. 
I, I um, and this has caused, I, I know we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit, but this has kind of been an, an, under, uh, an undercurrent source of some of the um, division and schism that we've seen within the apostolic Christian church in recent years. You know, for example, the apostolic Christian church now has um, four, four pillars of their, I'm not going to articulate this exactly, but like their vision for, for, or four values. These are the four values that we stand for. And it's, it's, it's graphically illustrated with four columns. And it looks like, uh, looks like just some sort of basic Greek Roman architecture. That is something that comes out of business management psychology. We articulate our vision, our purpose statement. We put it in this little digestible um, graphic and it kind of represents us, whatever the ground reality actually is. And um, the, the apostolic Christian elders had also recently gone through like this re, um, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but sort of like a revisioning of uh, what the institution of the church represents. And it, and it very much, re it very much paralleled a lot of the revisioning and purpose statements um, that you find in corporate America these days. In, in the late, uh, in the mid to late 1900s, uh, the concept of um, the, the um, management exploiting the labor moved away from what Marxists could easily critique as just exploit, 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 get everything you can out of them to something that was much more psychological. Now, as now you're in the business, you're part of our family, you're part of our team, you're part of the, the, the visions. Are you going to get on board with the team? It now emphasizes relationships. So the business is now becoming sort of like this total all in all to your psychic being. Whereas before it was just exploit you, you little bug, until you don't exist anymore. Yeah. But there's still kind of this level of exploitation, but it's much more psychological and it's surrounded with like this. This, this business management jargon. You see that coming into the churches, which means that more and more among the apostolic Christian leadership, you have wealthy men who are church leaders who are applying business management psychology tactics to how they manage the church. This is a very subtle transition, but one that people feel, realize, but aren't able to put their finger on so well about what's changing in my church. Now, several years ago, there was a major schism in the Apostolic Christian Church of America, unlike has been experienced since 1905. This was a nationwide division. The group that started up was called the Apostolic Christian Faith. It is a stricter group that, it, that is attempting to hear, adhere more closely to the particular tenets of the historic Apostolic Christian Church of America. Why did they divide off when they did? There has been tremendous diversity within the Apostolic Christian Church of America for many, many decades. People, when they went and visited churches, would be a little bit selective. If you were on the more progressive fringe, you would probably visit other churches on the progressive fringe. If you were on the more conservative side, you would visit other churches on the conservative side, basically just to keep the peace. Probably um, at the same time since uh, it was post-World War II, there became step-by-step -step more centralization of the Apostolic Christian Church. Many of its members have been spread out across, um, across areas of the frontier on the, in the Midwest, um, and churches were fairly congregational. After World War II, there were steps towards more centralization. Eventually, this meant that the denomination owned all of the church buildings, which is unparalleled in the rest of the plain Anabaptist denominations that the, that the denomination would become that centralized. And also there was um, maybe a greater sense of hierarchy of the elders. So within each apostolic Christian church, there's going to be several leaders. Amongst them, there is one elder who is the leader of the leaders. The elder body um, comes together at least twice a year and has um, 
conferring meetings where things get decided. In the 1980s, when there was a good bit of centralization, um, there was also concern about changes in some of the doctrines of the Apostolic Christian Church, influenced by what was called new evangelism. And I'm not, sometimes I don't even think I know what the word evangelical means anymore, but we're just going to say like the contemporary Christian sentiment represented best by your local community contemporary church. The ideas that circulate there. I don't know if that's evangelical or not, but it's modern American Christianity. So they were sort of concerned about some of these trends. Um, they wrote up a pamphlet called The Winds of Doctrine that was endorsed by the elder body. It was a fairly conservative group of elders at that point. I am told that that began to transition as a lot of small apostolic congregations, especially in urban areas, ordained their own elders. And then in those urban small congregations, there, there was a bit more of a, an, I won't say liberal, but I will say a moderate establishment oriented leadership that wasn't particularly adamant on either conservatism or even progressive changes moving in another direction, but sort of amplified the centralized establishment orientation of the apostolic Christian church. That had major consequences in the 90s, but especially in the 2000s, when the elder body began um, more assertively intervening in congregations where there were conservative elders who held to a greater sense of, um, uh, of, for lack of a better word, discipline. Rittman in Ohio, where Twinkie comes from, was one of those congregations. Yeah, if I can, a, I'm just going to interrupt you real quick uh, oh, b- because you're going to be talking about the elder specifically who baptized me. So, um, you know, you mentioned this in your article that there was intervention and uh, a particularly conservative elder was silenced to some degree. I apologize if those aren't your exact words, so you can correct me. But but there was a movement to basically say, what you're saying here is not what we necessarily all stand in. And wh- while I left the church in 2004, so the split happened eight years later, it was as plain as Dave is to me on this Zoom feed that there was undeniable division and then theology in, um, we're talking a Calvinistic approach, you know, to theology, even within some members, which would maybe equate to a little more of the modern evangelical that we just referred to, um, versus, you know, the more Anabaptist, uh, their traditional Anabaptist bent. But I, I, what reading your, your write up here, uh, about five pages of it was just, um, uh, took me right back to some of those conversations you refer to uh, people staying after church services for hours, uh, pleading with each other and having these conversations about, you know, believing that the other person, you know, was gone on the wrong path if they were to go with this, this, you know, the opposite of what they, this person believed, Um, you know, just this real passion that, um, that these minor differences, sorry, what I view as minor differences might be um, to them, these huge gulfs. And the example I, I think of is there were earlier divisions in the apostolic church over the mustache, right? Or um, uh, language, right? Uh, well, we don't want to adopt English. We want to stay with our German language or um, all of these divisions that seemed a little bit minor now to these people in the early 2000s now have their own divisions that in my mind seem minor, but to them are vast gulfs that were almost untenable. And, and I think that links into to what you're about to do here. When <laughs> uh, the, uh, there's a tendency to look on religious groups and look at their divisions and arguments and just think, how unchristian is this? But um Any conflict, any human conflict looks so trivial when you've removed it from its context. And so when you're looking on the context of another group and looking at some of their arguments, you're like, what is, really? We have to understand this, that on the one hand, these people, in this case, in the Apostolic Christian Church in the 2000s, 
agreed on enough stuff to have conversations where they disagreed with each other. Human groups are going to be able to symbolically represent um, serious underlying differences on a whole, a whole constellation of ideas and practices by boiling it down to maybe several key points that may seem really trivial, but, but symbolically just carry so much, so much uh, value um, to those people. And they know it. They may not come out and consciously say, well, the mustache versus no mustache conflict. And you're referring back to the 1905 division um, between the Swiss apostolic migrants and the new Eastern European Nazarene migrants. But I also knew that the, there's more going on than just the simple mustache. That mustache represents orientations. It represents values. It represents choices of who you're, who you're aligning yourself with. So ultimately, when we get to the 2012 division between the Apostolic Christian Church of America and the Apostolic Christian Faith Church, which is breaking off, we are looking at the key point in the division. The key point was a doctrinal point. It wasn't the only issue, but it was a key one. And that doctrinal issue is, did the blood of Jesus shed on the cross cover all of your sins for all of time or just until you repent? Yeah, what that happens after... Um, I repent and I am now a member of the church and I've gone through this rigorous process and I've agreed to live a life they refer to as the overcoming life, a holy life. And I tell a lie. Right. That's, that's the question we're asking here, right? Yeah. I, I, what you're talking about. So, so on so, one yeah. hand, people would say the blood of Jesus covers your sin then. On the other hand, they would say, no, you may not plead the blood of Jesus at that point. You do have an advocate of Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father who can plead on your behalf, but you are not to claim the blood of Jesus uh, to cover your sin after you've repented. And when I first found out what this little conflict was, I say little conflict, because to me, I'm like, um, when someone first asked me what I thought, I had no idea. I never thought about it. It was just like, oh, uh, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> um and at first, this seems really trivial. How can you not have had a major division in your denomination for over 100 years, and then this question bogs you all down? Well, there's a lot more going on in that question. Because that one question represented, um, am I free to just kind of sin, and, and Jesus is just going to take care of that all the time? Or after I've repented, am I committing myself to a real walk of holiness where sin is taken seriously? And then if you dig a little bit deeper, that second explanation is much more consistent with the historic apostolic view where holiness is emphasized among the believer, where the former view, Jesus just covers, Jesus just, his blood just covers my sin. Oh, Hallelujah. Um, I am saved, I am saved, I am saved, I am saved, I am saved. That's much more of a modern Christian view and emphasis that, that doesn't really um, stress holiness as part of the large equation in, in the, the, Christian, the Christian way. On the one side, people who are probably consuming popular culture a lot more through audiovisual media, maybe also through sports. Anti-sports was a big apostolic thing. Um, once you repent, no more sports. These people are also considerably more wealthy on average on this more, you know, Jesus' blood always covers my sin. They're going to be considerably more wealthy on average, and they're going to be much more involved in like business psychology and management of their churches, which is the same tactics that a lot of these contemporary Christian uh, churches are also using. They are also going to be the ones more inclined, the leaders are going to be the ones more inclined to adopt that um, motivational speaker type of sermon style that I talked about earlier. And to offer Christianity that's more therapeutic rather than more about discipleship and holiness. 
therapeutic Christianity is um, the going trend right now because we live in a really stressed age that um, uh, uh, just in society in general. And this is just one way that society in general is responding to all of our stress is offering uh, a more therapeutic version of Christianity. So you see this whole like package of ideas that just go simply with this one argument. So you look and say that's such a trivial, trivial argument. But on the other hand, we are seeing very different trajectories of these two groups. Let's look at their numbers for a moment. Um, what, is, what has been the population trends among the apostolic Christian group? So I mentioned earlier that plain Anabaptists as a rule are growing, 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 growing. And as a rule, the stricter, the faster the growth. That, in fact, seems to hold for a lot of uh, Christianity in America. The stricter the group, the faster it seems to be growing. Why? That's a huge discussion among sociologists of religion. I won't dig into it, but I will at least see does the apostolic case line up with it. Okay, in 2012, before the division within the apostolic Christian church, there was 12,600 members and right about 23,000 people. So people would include all the children. It's a nice measure of growth to see that um, um, you've got that many, that many who are not members. So these are children who can possibly be members when they grow up. And then you had right about 100 congregations. So that's in 2012. In 2020, among the Apostolic Christian Church of America, the number of members has dropped by 1,300. We're down to around 11,300 members. And then the total population has dropped by 3,000 people. We're down to 19,800. So between 2012 and 2020, the Apostolic Christian Church of America lost people. Okay, now how much of that was from the Apostolic Christian Faith Division? When the Apostolic Christian Faith Church, um, around 2014, when the movement had settled down, there was approximate, approximately 950 members. We are looking at less than one-tenth the size of the Apostolic Christian Church of America, this little division, less than one-tenth. And then about um, 2,000 people. In 2020, the apostolic Christian faith has grown by 25%. In six years, this stricter splinter group has grown by 25%. Yeah, that's fascinating. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't have a figure right offhand for what the apostolic Christian Church of America membership was after the division. So let's combine the apostolic Christian Church of America population with the faith church population for 2020. And if we look at 2012 versus 2020 numbers, there was a decline of 4%. So the population in both groups, which were one in 2012, but are divided in 2020 had to decline by 4%. So during that time that all of them declined, the faith church grew by 25%. How much more then did the Apostolic Christian Church of America actually decline? So their loss of members was not just due to this apostolic Christian faith group going out. In fact, they probably lost even more people leaving the church on the other side. Like me. And going mainstream during yeah. that period. So even though the faith church really shook people up, and you can really get people's emotions if you so going if you even just bring it up, everyone's got something to say about it. Um, it's gotten it's gotten softer over time, but there were some hard, hard, strong feelings and words when that thing first happened. Yeah. So you you mentioned that, or you characterize it as bitter and wrecking affections and sentiments, which, by the way, are great words, and I really love them. Um, what 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 like what how what made you or how did you come to that conclusion? It, it, was it in those interviews when you brought it up and you saw the look in people's eyes and the I'm assuming tears, um, but just knowing knowing some of the people, but just the the the, the passion that you saw. I, I don't know if I could have put it any better than you just did. Yeah, I've observed many 
um, church divisions across plain Anabaptism in my short time amongst them since 2002. And I have not, <laughs> there's only one other division that I think of that had this level of intensity of just the way people talked about what happened, just the sense of betrayal, the sense of the other side is, is just, you know, on, on the path to damnation. They are, they are doctrinally wayward. They have lost the way. Of course, there was, they haven't had a major division since 1905. They have had draining of members, but not like an institutional division. I don't think the faith church would exist right now if it weren't for the extent to which the establishment moderate oriented leadership made the conservative side felt like they were no longer represented, that they no longer had a voice, that they no longer were safe even in their own churches. Even the most conservative apostolic Christian church of America ones right now, those still who didn't go with the faith church but are still committed are there, there's just still a lot of unrest and uncertainty about losing losing what they have cherished about their denomination at the hands of a much more centralized moderate establishment oriented leadership yeah i i I find the topic fascinating and and I think for the right reasons, just in that it contextualizes for me, I guess, the, the feelings and the inner conflicts that I was having at the time as well. I remember being, I think grilled is probably not the exact right word, but, you know, someone kind of pulling me aside and saying, do you believe that you started your conversion process? You made the decision or do you believe it was this irresistible pull from God for you to start your repentance. And in essence, asking me about Calvinism, right? Asking me, you know, if God decides it's time, it designated you to, to uh, begin the walk with him, you don't have any control and you're going to do it because it's been predetermined and predestined, um, you know, but, but those kind of conversations already taking place. And I wouldn't have been able to explain that to you, of course, now years later and having done research on on, on some of these things, I have a little better understanding about it. But, you know, on the other side of it, if you would have walked into my church uh, and I and, and had approached me in 2003 and said, you know, um, how do you identify yourself? I don't think I would have even known enough to, to call myself a plain Anabaptist. Uh, uh, and I don't know if that was my own lack of education or maybe the church not doing as good a job as they could be doing to educate the people that are going to or attending that church on the history and what, you know, where they came from. So I'm curious, is someone like myself an outlier in the sense of not really understanding as a, just a general lay attendee member, understanding the context of the apostolic church or, or is that maybe a little more widespread? So I would say the experience you described would be representative. I think that carries in most denominations. Um, people may not have a, this large context of their particular denomination, but they know they know who the familiar faces are each Sunday, and these are the people that they trust and love. Um, I don't think your experience would be out of the ordinary. Yeah, I mean, and frankly, I know more, way more about the Apostolic Church, Christian Church of America, and it's kind of various, the, the Nazarene church and some of that, ha, ha, having done research. And then your article was fantastic to really kind of put a point on it. Uh, way more now than I did even um, certainly before I was a member, during a member, uh, immediately after was a very challenging period. Just there's a lot of emotion, almost it's kind of, in reading your talk about a schism, I, I'm like a mini schism, you know, when you leave and separate from something like that, you leave behind family. And you leave behind friends and connections and so on and so forth. And it is a really volatile time. Um, but it, it really intrigues me when, when you talk about this intensity, because I do know that there are so many people with good intentions who are wonderful people. Um, and for them to have to experience that um, must have been very challenging. And uh, especially when you contextualize it with, it's not necessarily these types of intense splits are, aren't necessarily 
representative of when a split happens in other plain Anabaptist churches. I remember um, I was at a church service at an apostolic Christian church. It'd be a bit more of the conservative end. Didn't go with the faith church. Some of their people had gone with the faith church. And um, the minister that morning was, he was a guest from another congregation. And it was a, it was a fairly progressive congregation that would embrace the, the motivational um, speaker type of preaching style found in, in modern Christianity. And um, after that sermon, I was, I was sitting next to this elderly man at the lunch um, for listeners who may not know, yeah. you get a lunch um, after every Sunday service um, in an apostolic Christian church, which is a, it's a, an interesting time to sit down and just converse with people. Yeah, we're going to quiz you on common lunch servings uh, at the end of this. So I hope you're hope you're prepared. Okay. Uh, no, I'm <laughs> I understand that the lunch is just a preamble for the, for the treats. I, yeah. I kept tabs on everything I'd eaten in all these churches. From, yeah. Like, wow to the pastries. Yeah. Everywhere. Um, and I was sitting, talking to him, and he was just obvious. He was just very disturbed. An elderly man, I'd say, in his 80s. And he just wondered, me as an outsider, what did you think of the sermon? I told him kind of what I'm telling you. I thought it was like a motivational speaker style sermon that would be more at home in modern modern community churches. And it's, it's being adopted and yet misapplied in an apostolic church setting where their emphasis, their tradition, their structure is not really set up for community church style strategies, outreach strategies. It's, it's going to transform the church more than it's going to help it. And I just told him these things. And he looked at me and just said, thank you. I, uh, I just did not feel comfortable with it, but I just didn't know. I just didn't know. That was kind of his plea. If, if you're loyal to your church and you don't go visiting other church services and you believe in your doctrine and you don't read around in a lot of, a lot of other doctrines or listen to messages by other preachers, if you're, if you're loyal and at home in your congregation, you're going to also be in a much weaker position to explain what you see that makes you feel uncomfortable. And um, while he was maybe, he was one who was obviously very concerned about the loss of the, 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 the change and loss of something that was very valuable to him in the religion. I think it also, there, there's just as many, I guess you could say, losses and casualties going on of people ending up out in the mainstream, out of the apostolic Christian church, out of Anabaptism altogether, uh, probably a lot like your experience. Um, I, I can't say all of your experience, but it sounds like you had some confusion, some searching, and, and stresses over what all these conversations and debates were even about within your church. Yeah, I, I can uh, certainly, w- without doing a deep dive, it's really challenging for a person like myself who struggles with anxiety, um, um, some levels of depression, to um, feel the pressure of being holy and perfect. Um <laughs> Because I recognize very, <laughs> very clearly, it's in front of my, I, I tell my coworkers at work that I see my failures in front of my eyes all the time for whatever reason. I don't know what, what sort of curse I have, but, you know, walking around with the weight of failure and not feeling any sort of relief from that because you don't know if there is relief, right? There is no covering of sin. There's just a chance that you've got some intercession going on and, when you get to the end, we'll see what happens. That kind of attitude almost um, is really challenging when you're an anxious person. <laughs> so, um, Interesting point. The intersection of uh, <laughs> psychology and sociology. Yeah. Nights that fit certain denominations <laughs> and ones that don't. Um, yeah. And so in, in wrestling with that, I had to then wrestle with just the exact point that you're talking about with some of those discussions that happened. So obviously there's some, some depth and some other things that we won't dive into here, but for sure, you know, um, I, I was at the time that I left the apostolic church working for someone who, um, was a member, um, owned a business and there were many coworkers who were members of the apostolic church and the degree to which I was treated by some people, um, was varied, you know, 
in spite of what religion you're a part of or what denomination you're involved in, you're still a human being, right? With feelings and fears and joys and frustrations and concerns. And um, uh, people treated me very well. Other people out of concern for me. And I think well-intentioned said some things that were very harsh and uh, frankly terrible, but, you know, being able to contextualize it each time I revisit this and in, in conversations like this is very healing. So I know you said you're not a psychologist, but you still get to serve an excellent purpose. So I hope you can at least uh, walk away knowing that you've uh, been helping out in more ways than just information. Well, I consider myself somewhat interdisciplinary. So. Yeah, okay. Perfect. <laughs> and if I may, it may say on a little bit of a personal note, as little as little as I know you at this point, um, you do kind of have that warm, calm gentleness that I would expect of an apostolic. <laughs> we like, can't imagine well, well, running into you at one of their churches, Dave. Um, I'm guess I'm guessing that little apostolic girl was in a rebellious stage when she dated yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel so much cooler than I am. Yeah, oh, that's how I'm gonna take it anyway. Uh. <laughs> It's true. He crimped her hair and all this business. Oh, it was man. A, wow. That's <laughs> <it> bangs. crazy. <laughs> you know, she was 10. <laughs> uh, delightful, I'm sure. Um, we, we do have one final question. We remember from articles that you are a fan of pastry, so we're going to make you pick. Sure. Cake or pie? Well, I was from Virginia. That's the South. And when I'd go to birthday parties, I would scrape the icing off because I did not like it. Oh, you were one of those kids. Okay. And my mom, when she made a pie, she would cut up the fruit of the peaches, of the apples, and would pack that pastry crust with so much fruit that I thought pie was in my blood. But when I came among the Amish and the Mennonite people, they fed me pies that absolutely revolted me. (laughs) Because their pies followed recipes to extend the flavor and calories across as many pies as possible because they are cooking for crowds. My mom cooked for me and my sister. Mennonites, Amish, maybe even apostolics are baking for huge crowds. How can, you can't like pit how many cherries, the pack of cherry pie full of cherries. Um, so I am very picky about my pies, even as you didn't know that this was going to be quite an in-depth answer. <laughs> I respect <laughs> this deep level of detail. This is this is long walk, short drink. You, yeah. You're fitting right in. This, this is, is actually a level. This is actually an area I would like to claim expertise on. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so what do they put instead of fruit in their pies? Like gelatin goobly gop. No. I remember I bought a pie one time. Everyone raves about Amish baked goods. I'm like, Okay, sometimes. A lot of <laughs> donuts are a nice special treat. Um, the more flies that have been sitting on them for some reason, the better. Um, but their pies, I had bought a cherry pie one time that contained all of six cherries in it. I threw the thing out. The reason is because they, some of them will buy these big tubes of pie filling with little suspended chunks of fruit in it, but just a lot of pectin, food coloring, and flavoring. And they squeeze that into a pie shell and they call it a pie. No, thank you. A good pie will far excel a good cake, but a bad pie can hit pits that no cake can know. <laughs> That's the pull quote. <laughs> that it is the, definitely the pull quote. It, uh, I've, I'm going to agree with this assessment, Dave. I've, I uh, agreed 100%. It's hard to argue with. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I would be a pie uh, person as well. Mm-hmm. But I hadn't considered the depths to which they could plumb. And, <laughs> yeah. and I don't know that I've experienced them yeah. quite to the extent uh, that our distinguished guest has. And when I say distinguished, I mean in the realm of culinary baking expertise. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate the uh, 
you know, the extent to which you're generous with your time and, and, um, and your, your knowledge about, um, about the apostolic tradition. And, uh, I appreciate you coming, like you were mentioning being, um, you know, not quite fitting in any one place. And here you are, you know, talking about, I mean, this, I know this seemed like a weird fit when we first reached out, but, um, I hope it makes a little more sense to you. And it certainly makes all the sense in the world to, uh, to me. And, um, I'm grateful to, um, to be able to fold this into kind of the, the very long oral history we seem to be telling. <laughs> and so uh, this, this was great. And, um, I, as well as others need to unconvince ourselves about the matter of whether religion still matters in our popular culture today. It, it, it does. And so this was a great conversation to have. Well, thank you. Yes. And I, I definitely agree. Um, you know, uh, being fully transparent, you know, even as a, it, it being a, a past part of my life, it still influences me, um, even subconsciously. Um, and so anytime that I can add information and, um, support to know myself a little bit better, I value that. And this has been, um, an exceptional experience to do just that. And if there, there are any folks that come across this, um, you know, on the internet, um, you know, for, for any of those folks, any of those kind of just seekers who might not be regular long walk, short drink listeners, but are, you know, um, when Twinkie hit me to your research, I did a Google search and came across a bunch of stuff. And now this conversation may well end up there. Where, where would you like to kind of direct folks to learn more uh, about your work? I think they could visit the page AmishStudies.org, which is the professional association that I helped found. It's also the sponsoring association for our journal. So you'll be able to get to the uh, Journal of Amish and Plain Anabaptist Studies through there. Um, and um, beyond that, I think, you know, at that Amish Studies website, you can pretty much link to many other places. My um, current academic position at um, Penn State, I also have a profile at the Population Research Institute at Penn State which has a uh, link to my Google Scholar profile that lists all my academic articles. I recommend those. I appreciate the um, the the humor you you find ways to inject into that as well. <laughs> it's delightful. Um, well, I, I I think I think we did it. I think I think we had this conversation that we were you know been looking forward to now for what three months, and I, I'm I'm grateful for it and. Well, and, and after you've made it through Dr. Anderson's CV, uh, if you'd like to contact us, you can uh, address your email to lwsdpod at gmail.com, uh, at lwsdpod on Twitter, lwsdpod.com for the show archive and links to other related media. And if you'd like to reach me directly, uh, the best way is email 330cabinkid at gmail.com. If it's crossed your mind while listening to this podcast, I'd love to hear about it. Questions, feedback, ideas, send them my way. I'd love to read them and share them with a group if uh, you're up for that. Yes, indeed. Dr. Anderson, thank you very much for being so generous with your time and knowledge with us today. It was, it was a real pleasure talking to you. You're welcome. I really enjoyed being here this evening and conversing with you all. Thanks again. I really do appreciate it. All right. Till next time. Cheers, Long Walkers.